Hello everyone, welcome to our journal club. This is for January 2023 and we're kicking it off uh, the new year with a very, very exciting topic. Uh, concussion vision problems, convergence, parvocellular versus magnocellular pathways and more. Uh, and with us we have someone who has great insight into this topic and her name is Dr. Becky Bliss and we're blessed to have her with us and I'm going to let her further introduce herself and her many credentials in a summarized manner. <laughs> hey Elena, thanks so much for having me. Um, just a little be brief background. Um, I've been a practicing PT for about 21 years um, and I started my concussion journey back in 2005, 2006 in Fort Bragg, North Carolina with all the returning military blast injury soldiers, mm -hmm. then polytrauma, yeah. multi-trauma, you name it. Um, I think I went from zero vestibular concussion evaluations on my schedule to the next week when we signed the contract to do some um, off post type of contract work to get everybody through to 13 new evals. So it was kind of like learn by assimilation um, and just started putting my nose in the books. Like that was back when vestibular rehab, like third edition, right? The fourth wasn't <laughs> even around and trying to figure it all out. Um, and then followed my military husband all across the country and ended up in the Midwest where I have transitioned into more sport related concussion. But I actually teach at the University of Missouri. I'm the program. Um, so I teach an entry level and then I'm the program coordinator for our neurological residency program. And then we run a multidisciplinary concussion team out of our outpatient neuro center where I still treat clinically. So I'm a little unique where, and we were talking about this before, um, I actually have access to neuropsychology, speech language pathologists, occupational therapists with vision specialties, physical therapists, athletic trainers, sports medicine physicians, and concussion neurology. So, <laughs> um, you know, not the typical, which is, um, you know, I'm super blessed with that. And then we also, we do not have a neuro optometrist right in Columbia, Missouri, but I have one on either side of me. So I am mid state and I've got two hours to the east in St. Louis and then two hours in the west in Kansas City. So we work collaboratively in our um, neuro optometrist from St. Louis, um, Cheryl Davidson actually mentors our occupational therapists and we do a lot of teleconsulting. Um, so we have it, we have that connection for all of our patients, which is really nice. So kind of a unique situation. And then this obviously bleeds over into my research line of research as well. Yes, you're not busy at all. All right, so <laughs> with that, we're gonna roll right into our slides here. I have done my best to try to distill an article that I selected uh, with the hopes of really kind of bring up a lot of good topics, but I admit for those who are brave enough to read it, I hats off to you. I mean, I did read it as well, obviously, but it's, it's definitely a little deeper on the science and very deep into optometry and optometric uh, assessments, um, different techniques and, and some novel science that they're doing, as far as I could tell. Um, the article was to, from 2017, but, you know, this doesn't seem to be, you know, widely prevalent as something studied and we know how in research there's always a matter of who's studying what when who's into it who has the funding and so forth so it doesn't mean it's not an area of value it's just you know there weren't you know tons of articles on this topic but I felt strongly um, because again and again myself and my own practice and you know clinicians that I speak with you know this kind of concern about patients coming in post concussion with various visual symptoms, some findings that we might see, and it's just kind of even what you call the bedside exam. We're not even using technology necessarily, and we're still seeing, you know, some things that say, hmm, I think, you know, there's some eye vision issues, you know, kind of, but from the brain level, right? We're not necessarily concerned about the physical health of the eye. I mean, we should make sure that doesn't look bad, but, you know, usually, you know, what we're seeing is more these kind of ocular motor, the control, you know, are the eyes working as a team, whatever you want to call it, you know, so... I just felt like this article was a nice way to really kind of dig into that and talk about different specialties, talk about how to work collaboratively and talk about, you know, what can a clinician do depending on where they are, who's available. And I know that, um, you know, Dr. Bliss has extensive experience um, kind of helping point people. So that's why I wanted to have her on point here. So I'm going to try 
my best to dig in to the basics here. So of course I can't really talk about this topic without touching on the peripheral vestibular system because the eyes and the inner ear have a close relationship. They are best friends. Um, sometimes they don't get along, but <laughs> that's true with best friends too. Um, so that peripheral vestibular system lives in our inner ear, deep in the inner ear, you know, gives us our, our sense of balance in collaboration with our vision and our joint sensors and some also a proposed hearing even, you know, kind of lots of different systems, sensory systems coming in to tell us where we are in space. Um, and with that, you know, the brain, the brain is kind of the, the, the really the true kind of, um, integrator of all this information to try to bring it together and you know kind of utilize that information so that we can again orient ourselves in the world and take in information and then do proper responses you know so we can catch our balance if we get knocked over or something like that all right so what is a concussion just uh, we had this topic in December we talked about uh, sports related concussions and return to play. Um, so this slide should look familiar. I use the same one because the anatomy has not changed or the, excuse me, the pathophysiology in this case has not changed to my knowledge. The science is still pretty much saying this is an injury to the brain uh, resulting in a temporary loss of normal brain function caused by some sort of trauma. Um, and it can be a direct hit or kind of this acceleration deceleration of the head. Um, this isn't a whiplash injury or a blast injury, um, and it does not require a loss of consciousness. So I covered this, I think, pretty well in December. Feel free to watch the beginning of that episode if you want more detail. But again, it's kind of this metabolic cascade that goes on, you know, all kinds of disruptions to kind of the, the cellular level, and there's an energy demand that changes here, um, and all of that results in uh, kind of a post concussive vulnerability, which they think may lead to why some percent of folks post concussion have more longer lasting deficits. And this would mean, you know, weeks, months, and even sometimes years uh, where we see issue. So let's talk about the eyes. <laughs> why do we look at the eyes when we're assessing patients post concussion? So um, I found in one piece of literature, at least, that the visual system involves roughly 50% of the brain's circuits. Uh, that's a lot. <laughs> so it makes sense um, that after concussion, we might see some sort of eye movement changes or ocular motor findings. Um, and I'm going to kind of start to dip uh, Dr. Bliss into this. So do you have anything else you want to add specifically on that fact that you know? Um, I think we, I think the biggest thing to think about is we take it for granted. So all of this is happening subconsciously all day long, right? We don't appreciate these systems of the vision and vestibular system until something's actually wrong with them. So we all take for granted what our eyes do for us. Um, I think it's interesting. My husband has been having some degrading near vision and it's really like making him cognitively fatigued at the end of the day. And I'm mm. like, I wonder why, right? Your eyes are working 20 times harder than they need to all day long while you're at your computer. Um, so it's the conversations that we have all the time. But it is hugely affected post head trauma, concussion, blast injury, you know, even whiplash. If you look at any of Julia Trevelin's work mm -hmm. um, out of Australia. And so I think we're just touching the surface about how much our ocular motor system has an effect on postural control, neck proprioception, um, our integration with the visual vestibular. Um, and we're going to get into the parvo and magnocellular balance, which I think is... If I had, if I was a betting woman, I feel like it is the missing link to the one of the missing links to the higher um, level neuromotor control deficits that is responsible for subsequent lower extremity musculoskeletal injury mm -hmm. back on the field. Mm -hmm. So, and we can talk about all that in a little bit too. About it's coming. Training. Yes, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. No, but you make an excellent point. We do take it for granted. You don't know what you got till it's gone. Everybody says that, but it's really true. Um, so um, you'll hear us mention on and off and other folks when they talk about concussion, how we examine this. Obviously, there's technology and we, I do touch on that briefly towards the end. But, you know, I'm kind of presuming that folks don't always have access 
um, to more involved technology. So we're looking at our basic bedside or uh, sideline type exams here. Um, and one that comes up again and again is that VOMS, that vestibular ocular motor screening. Um, so if you're not familiar with that, I recommend reading up on that. There's beautiful um, kind of information uh, on the internet about that and how to do it and how to do it properly. So, you know, if you want to take it for what it's supposed to be, you should do it properly. I've seen it done a variety of ways and it's not to be judgmental, but just to say, you know, when they do research, they're try to be consistent. Um, and so we should hopefully try to be, you know, at least fairly consistent. I mean, sometimes we are limited by time or someone's focus and I get that. So, you know, there are adjustments that we can make. Um, do you want to kind of add anything about the VOMS specifically, Becky? Yeah. So what's interesting about the VOMS is it was originally designed in 2014 um, out of UPMC's group and AMUCA's group, but it's designed for the non right vestibular ocular specialists. And I think that's important because a lot of people are like, Becky, do you use the VOMS? I'm like, no, because yeah. my exam is so much deeper than the VOMS. Right. Um, but I will teach it to anybody who is non vestibular ocular specialized because it is a beautiful tool. It's false positive rate in identifying acute con con concussion is 2% as compared to other measures out there like the King Devic test and some other things mm -hmm. that have high false positives. Um, so the work uh, itself on it is emerging as we all know. Um, but I think the other big thing that just got released in this last year is a pediatric version of the mm -hmm. bombs. So they have validated the pediatric version. So I think that's good to remember for those individuals working with younger um, kiddos that may sustain head trauma. Um, because a lot of the same measures, like I think of like, you and I probably use it all the time, the dizziness handicap inventory, mm -hmm. like, you know, that is not validated for little ones. And you ask them like, do your friends think you're intoxicated? Well, should we be asking a 12 year old that? Um, or, you do know, they do even they... know what that would feel like? I mean, it's kind of like, <laughs> yeah, or, or look or like, or whatever. Dizzy in the grocery store. Well, I mean, some 12 year olds have never been to the grocery store with their parents. So <laughs> Like, I just think we have to think about like validation of our tools within the patient population mm -hmm. that we use. Them. You spoke really great about the standardization um, of the measure and making sure you are doing it appropriately so that we're measuring apples to apples each time. Um, I use the VOMS, especially with all of my athletic training. Um, like those are my biggest referrals and my biggest colleagues. And so they usually administer it early and then I can take a look at it and see what are the trends and what am mm -hmm. I seeing? I think the other thing to think about with the VOMS is the first several items are all ocular motor. And so if you're aggravating symptomologies and the patient's getting symptomology in the first several, <laughs> yeah. then we can think more ocular. If all those are good and then it comes down into VOR and VMS, then we're thinking more vestibular. And they did that intentionally to build upon the two systems and how they work together. Yes, yes. And we have to thank the team, uh, Anamuka and the whole team that, you know, has have done such important work. I mean, many folks do great work on concussion. I don't want to just focus on pit, but I think, you know, uh, I just want to express gratitude for that for sure. So let's talk convergence specifically. Convergence is part of the VOMS. It's something that people look at independently from time to time. A lot of debate that I have heard <laughs> about convergence. Um, there seems to be a, a definite uh, trend that you know many folks with concussion will have some measure of abnormality on the ability to draw their eyes together. That's kind of how I think of convergence. Can I look closer and then um, some people look at also at the ability to then come away again and to be able to do both is very important so that um, functionally a patient of mine might say, oh, when I look down at my computer screen, you know, because I'm typing something and I look up at, you know, a speaker that I'm listening to uh, in a meeting or, you know, uh, as a student in a lecture or what have you, and I look at their screen, and, but the back and forth, that bothers me which could be other things, but um, it can be concussion, or excuse me, convergence issues. So this convergence insufficiency officially, as I have seen it, defined as the inability of the eyes to draw together sufficiently at a given distance to bring an object into focus, particularly the nearer the object is. So um, convergence insufficiency you know, is not zero in a non-concussion population. I'd like to remind folks of that. And the trouble that we have often as clinicians is we don't get 
a baseline. We don't get to know what a person was like before they come to us, say post concussion or whatever their injury is, frankly. Um, so, you know, we don't really know, is it, it might be abnormal, but was it always, we don't really know. Um, you know, we try to go off of some measures and symptoms and do the best we can. Um, convergence deficiency was found in about 42% of adult of athletes in one study that they did. I think it was actually at a pit, um, in sports related concussion and, uh, kind of a similar number, I would honestly say at 38 to 49% in children post concussion. So you want to add to that for me, please, Dr. Bliss. Um, I think it is. Good to say, please document and know how you are measuring it mm -hmm. because I know our functional vision occupational therapists measure it different than PTs with the MPC right from the nose. They use more standardized measures. Obviously, neurooptometrists and optometrists are going to look at it a little bit differently too. So, like, please standardize that. Um, know your cutoff scores. And I think, like, in itself, if this is like you see it, but they're not functionally reporting symptomologies, I don't get all excited yes. and, you know, like make <laughs> mountains out of mohills. Um, I think that's the biggest thing. It's like, does everything relate back to function of what they're saying? Um, are they functionally complaining of exactly what you said near far? Because convergence is part of that like tripod of accommodation, right? And pupillary constriction. Um, and really looking at it in that and how it relates to function, but then also thinking, and we're going to get to this for intervention to the principles of neuroplasticity, what do they have to be able to do? And can mm -hmm. they do it at the rapid speeds that they need to, to be safe to return to whatever their job, work, sport, you name it, um, is going to be, I'm going to put a plug, our, um, occupational therapists use the CISS, the Convergence mm. Insufficiency Symptom Scale. Um, and it has really great psychometrics. Um, so it's a patient reported outcome measure and it's a subjective of asking more functional questions mm. of whether or not this is interfering with good um, sensitivity for cutoff scores. So if you're not already using that, that might be something nice in your repertoire to have um, or, you know, looking at. Good tip, CISS, all right. Yeah. So oh, yes. you knew I was coming up to this. You like read my mind. So this is the classic way that I personally was trained, and I believe many physical therapists uh, similarly so. Um, you know, we're taught to test convergence, which is, is considered to be a near point convergence type test. So we have some sort of um, target, if you will, a pen, a pencil, a finger, a tongue depressor. I've seen a lot, uh, <laughs> you know, with maybe a letter on it. Some people use that kind of formal accommodation convergence type ruler, a little slidey dealy on it. You put a little piece of paper with a letter. Um, some people are really particular about the size of letter. Like you said, I think the more you get towards an optometrist perspective, neurooptometrist perspective, you're going to probably have more specific tests than what you might quick see, uh, <laughs> you know, a PT or perhaps even athletic trainer again, sideline might do something more, uh, uh, efficient, we'll say, um, and less specialized. And then kind of moving it in, asking the patient to say, let me know when you see this object or letter double. Um, and sometimes I've seen this referred to in the literature as break. Um, and um, then you measure that distance. Normal, I've heard people say five to seven centimeters. I've heard up to 10 centimeters is normal. Uh, I want to put a little input on that one before we proceed here. <laughs> no, the VOMS cutoff is what, less than six centimeters. I think it's variable out there depending on the literature. Um, I think this needs to be in the world of rehab. Now, my occupational therapist, like I trust them, like, you know, they, they work with my neurooptometrist. For myself, I feel like it's a screening. Like, I, you know what I mean? Is there something going on? Is there something functionally? Can I correlate it to their subjective? Um, do I think just some brief things can help it and we'll see how it goes? Or do I think it's something more serious that they need to see um, neurooptometry and my referral is earlier? And we'll, I know that we're going to get to talk about like yes. when yes. Um, we do that in different things. So I think, you know, even with reading the article of how many different measures yes. there were of near vision <laughs> assessment, um, really lends to this is not, you know, fully 
wholly within our scope, um, but it's something we screen so we can work collaboratively and multidisciplinary because how much does vision relate to balance and vestibular and they're all and postural control and dual tasking and reaction. I mean, we can keep going, right? Um, so it's how do we all work together, right? To get the intended outcome. Um, and so for me, it's a screen that I then work functionally based off the principles of neuroplasticity with the visual system and postural control and reaction time and dual and multitasking. Yes, yes, and yes. All right. The other thing I wanted to point out is that sometimes, and I have definitely witnessed this and I'm sure you have, the patient will deny that anything ever doubles. And I remember when I first had this happen and I was quite young, I was like, oh, is it zero? I don't know. But if you pay attention, often one eye <laughs> just didn't pull in. So they're not going to see double, folks case you haven't seen this before or it's not familiar to you <laughs> so you still when you see one eye start to deviate i've usually seen it go laterally you can speak to any other variations you might have seen it's typically laterally yeah then you would measure at that point <laughs> not you know oh i never went double i guess it's zero uh, now i'm not saying someone couldn't have really good convergence where like really you get really super close um, and it could be more like two centimeters or something. So I'm not saying that's impossible, um, but I am saying watch those eyes. That's my message there. Um, and then there's this description that I have not been taught to do, but it seems like at least some optometrists are doing, maybe OTs, um, where they're measuring this recovery point. And it's mentioned in the article, so I wanted to talk about it briefly. This is where you're coming back out then and you're asking them basically, as I understand it, when did that get single again? So undouble, whatever you want to call it, and measuring that point. And normal, um, from one source that I found online, for whatever that's worth, seemed reputable, said 15 centimeters, uh, was still considered normal. So it's not necessarily that same point as where it went double. Now, you want to add anything to any of that? Go for it. <laughs> um, interesting. Well, and we may get to this. Um but I will like as if I see an eye kind of deviate out, I'll push back a little bit and then have them do physiological diplopia where they look at something near and then they put something in the distance. And if they can focus on the, the near point, how many objects do they see in the distance? That's normal physiological diplopia. That's what we should mm -hmm. see is look in the near things in the, you know, far or behind it should double. And sometimes just by them being aware, they can actually start to like binocular fuse and pull their eyes together. And it actually gets better within session, which is why rehab works. But you have to imagine, depending on how long it takes these individuals to get to us. And if as they're pulling in for near point, one eye is constantly going out, they're learning maladaptive motor patterns, yes. right? It's maladaptive neuroplasticity and they're suppressing that eye. And so sometimes they just don't like the brain doesn't know there's something wrong until we kind of show it. And then because this is not a structural, but more of a functional synaptic, right. right? With the axons, the rehab or just the awareness of the patient knowing makes it better within session. I just had this with a patient with a geriatric, like one of my older adult patients. So a geriatric concussion patient, um, who had been just thinking it was age for years. And she had had a massive head fall down a set of stairs resulting in a superior canal dehiscence of her ear. It was so bad. So, um, and she had just dismissed the visual stuff because everything else was so much more like, you know, traumatic. That right. They were dealing. <laughs> Prioritization. <laughs> when I read and she's a physician, you know? Um, so I stopped reading my, you know, articles and, like, and so when, as we got deeper, we just looked at convergence and obviously one eye was not coming in. So we did a little thing and she's like, oh my gosh, like, yeah. So yes, um, it's complex in order to get good at it. You have to practice it, but please, please, please find mentors and friends. Yes. And yes. that's the only reason why I'm good at this is back in 2005, 2006, I had a wonderful neurooptometrist I work with, um, who was part of Fort Bragg's TBI clinic. Um, and we, you know, I dove deeper and wanted to understand. So, mm -hmm. yeah. And the great thing is, you know, like you said, with Tella, 
um, health, you can do telementoring. And so there's a lot of ways that, you know, with patient permission, you might be able to get a video and be like, hey, I had this patient, this is what I saw, you know, so there's a lot of ways to get support. Um, and some are paid and some are free, but whatever, like do what you got to do. As long as it's someone who is knowledgeable and trustworthy, <laughs> then you, you know, want to kind of, yes, dig in and multiple people on your board of directors, as I like to call uh, my mentors. Um, so this leads us into another exciting topic, which I promised we would talk about. So here it is, and it's in the article too. What is, for those who don't know, parvocellular and magnocellular pathways? I'm going to tell you what I know, and then I want you to dig in deeper because I know you know like a lot more than me. So what I know is that there are visual pathways uh, that carry information from the eyes to the brain. Magnocellular is carrying information about large, fast things um, and is colorblind. And parvocellular carries information about small, slow, and colorful things. Um, so give me more. Oh, absolutely. This is one of my favorite things. Um, it was introduced to me probably about seven or eight years ago um, with, from my neurooptometrist. And as soon as I listened to her, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is so what the missing link is in retraining our patients functionally to be able to return to environments that are busy, lots of fast speed, but even from sport. And it really changed my mind about visual motion sensitivity. Mm -hmm. And the article speaks of this, which is fantastic. <laughs> um, because I was always like, oh, it's got to be optokinetic nystagmus. That's why they're visually motion sensitive. And I'm like, oh, no, not <laughs> at all. Like, and this is how we learn and grow and always know more. So I like to, and what it's been described to me from my wonderful neuro optometry friend, um, Dr. Ashley Riddell from Kansas City. Mm -hmm. But she... Um, we'll say like your parvo is your central, it's your what in front of you, it's your slow. I like to say like, if you were threading a needle, think about the eye of a needle and then the thread, like if you're sewing, that fine motor, our parvocellular guides fine motor and it tells you the what and it's slower. Your magnocellular and or AKA your ambient vision is it's also referred to is your where in space and it's lightning fast, and you really like think about crossing a street, you go out to the sidewalk, you look both ways, you go to cross and you look this way and you see something flash out of the side and you're like, well, let me wait. Like, just because it's that reactive. And so I would not be, um, not myself if I didn't bring this up of Patrick Mahomes, right? So we're getting ready to go. Um, they've got the bye week coming up, but think about, and this is actually spoken about very much sometimes on some of the broadcasters, but as well as with his trainer and what he actually trains, because you can upweight these systems. But think of when he gets the snap and he's got the ball and he is looking everywhere right around to get to his receiver. He can almost reactively think about that reactive ambient vision mm -hmm. without looking get out of how many sacks, right? Like he can reroute and either run the ball or get himself out of an almost tackle to then make the play because his ambient or magnocellular vision is so amazingly like upweighted. Mm -hmm. He never has to pay attention. He never has to look around him. He's looking down the field, right? For who he's going to play the ball to. And it's this sense and it's related to our postural control. Um, you know, I have my patients that come in post concussion and they're like, I cannot tolerate my kitchen. I've got five kids and they run around and they start moving and I feel like I'm off kilter and I'm moving and I just have to get out of there. And then I'm automatically thinking like, uh, you are probably have shut down your ambient vision, right? Um, so you've shut down that magnocellular. And because we think about post-concussion, we've already talked about convergence. We've talked about like just blurring of vision, right? So what do we do? We lock in and we hold our upper cervical super tight and we would just pay attention to where right here, because if I don't do anything else, I'm okay, right? Okay, and now we've got vestibular stuff. So we're automatically, because we're not using it, we're losing it, shutting down our ambient vision. And then it makes it more sensitive because in normal life, we need a balance between parvo, yes. magno, parvo, magno. Yes. Um, and it's the ability to ignore also unimportant visual information in those fields without getting a heightened sense of our autonomic nervous system going into fight or flight. So we could talk all day about this. Um, and but, we're not going to because we only have a half hour left. But yeah. <laughs> um, this truly, the problem is, and this is going to get back to the article, is 
in the clinic for us rehab providers, we do not have a tangible way or an objective way to measure this. Yes. So, and that's what this article truly speaks to is, you know, outside of our scope, referring to neurooptometry so that we can actually tangibly look at this when we think this is an issue. Um, and that is what we need in future clinical practice because of the sensitivity and specificity of this actual problem being right long term. They may have already recovered from convert, like all our, our bedside exams all look good, but they're still subjectively complaining of this. Right. And there's not an objective way to measure it. And I think that's the best way to segue back to the article itself. Perfect. 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 Yes. So speaking of. Uh, in the article, it states that possible magnocellular deficits have been reported in individuals with a history of mild traumatic brain injury compared with visually normal control subjects. The study hypothesized that patients with convergence insufficiency and a history of concussion would show deficits in magnocellular processing. So this is what they tried to look at. And then they went real deep. And I am not going to do that because I am, A, not a neurooptometrist, nor do I have the time, to be honest. So... Please forgive me for those of you who are hoping for me to dig deep. I'm going to gloss over it a little bit. Um, There's obviously a lot of ways to learn more about this. So I encourage you, if you're into it, to feel free. Um, But what they did is they took some patients, some pediatric, some adult, more peds than adult. I just noted that kind of when I was looking. So it was interesting. Um, Criteria for their convergence insufficiency, you know, was uh, included but was not limited to kind of these different specific measures of a near point convergence and recovery. And um, they looked at some things using prisms. So I'm just going to say that it's definitely not my area, but enough to say that prisms are a way that neurooptometrists and optometrists who have training um, with prisms either way um, are using ways to kind of affect the alignment and focus of the eyes by using variable thickness um, glass, I guess I'll say plastic, I don't know, but they somehow basically are using some sort of um, means of kind of changing the thickness to change um, kind of the alignment. So it's, it's the science, it's deep. Um, I just pulled some quick images for folks to kind of get a sense of what that looks like, how they kind of hold these different, you know, um, prisms in different directions where the bases is kind of the whitest part, as you can see in that picture versus the apex, which is thinner. And that's going to kind of direct um, the way that we perceive things, how we're looking through these. All right. If you ever look through Coke bottle glasses, just understand that the kind of shape and thickness of a lens affects what you're going to see on the other side. (laughs) So not my science, but that's the deal. And they have different shapes they could do, convex, concave, etc. Um, and they did lots of other measures that were related, like, um, Becky pointed out. So, um, suffice to say, they did a very thorough job, as far as I can tell, <laughs> of assessing uh, different types of ways to look at convergence. And then they did this visually evoked potential response. This is an electrical signal generated from the visual cortex in response to visual stimulation. So this involves electrodes on the head. This is your classic, you know, if you want to think of science, <laughs> if it's not going to be little bottles that you're pouring into beakers, then you're thinking about electrodes on the head, okay? This is like... You know, definitely, uh, you know, what I envision for sure. And then they have this visual stimulus, checkerboards, sinusoidal patterns. um, And then they're, you know, um, having the person view these through their own normal correction, right? So it's normal for some people to need glasses. It's okay. It's okay for them to have context. This is just kind of their regular correction that they would use on a day-to-day basis from what I understand. Um, And that's what they did. And the results were, um, number one, that their convergence measures were not able to discriminate between those whose deficits were related to concussion and those who had other ocular motor problems, right? Because remember we said that there are people out there already without concussion that have convergence insufficiency. And all of their patients were ones that walked into an optometric clinic. This is not folks that are, you know, considered to be normals in the traditional sense of no ocular motor issues, just to be clear. They were looking at all people with ocular motor issues, some with concussions, some did not have a history of concussion. All right. Secondly, they did feel, and I'm trusting them on this because, again, the science was deep, so perhaps somebody way more experienced than me would have some 
complaints about the study, I don't know. Um, but from my level, I just could say what the study reports, which is that you know they felt that it did support a, a possible process for kind of trying to distinguish these magnocellular deficits. So good for them to try to hopefully move that science forward. As Becky said, I think it'll be really helpful to have that. Um, and then they want to go ahead and look at, of course, how do we rehab these patients? But they didn't have a lot of specific suggestions, and that's fair because, you know, you got to be able to measure something <laughs> if you're going to try to rehab it and then show progress, right? So no judgment on that. Um, they just kind of left that open to say, you know, vision therapy could help or something kind of general like that, which is okay. Um, so functional considerations. Um I found a different study, I just thought it was interesting, that mentioned that this kind of idea of the central peripheral vision, um, and, and Becky basically said the same thing, I'm just backing her up with literature, um, you know, could be due to changes in the magnocellular pathway, at least in part. Um, and if the magnocellular pathways are impaired post-concussion, this makes sense how we might then result in folks who we know um, people post-concussion often improperly weight visual information. Um, so they're kind of saying, oh yes, everything I see is really important. That's how I like to describe it to my patients. Um, and it's just too much instead of what I call filtering, um, you know, which is kind of saying I need to pay attention to this and I don't need to pay attention to that, um, which is what we do all the time without realizing it when we're driving, for example. Um, and that ability to know, oh, there's a car right there versus oh, there's a pedestrian way over there that has nothing to do with me and where I'm going, right? So I don't have to attend to that, right, person. So, um, and they've showed these changes in the brain, all right? So this is, you know, as best they can with functional MRI, real issues with us kind of reweighting. And this happens in other vestibular conditions. This is what some people call visual vertigo, um, and that's kind of a general term, visual motion sensitivity, you know, being sensitive to visual motion, right? So um, we're gonna talk about treatment because folks had tons of questions about treatment. Um, and I think this is a good opportunity to talk about what treatments are out there for these different visual issues that might result post-concussion, what a clinician might do or not do depending on their scope and when they would refer and things like that. So we're gonna start with convergence. Big debate on, some people are like, I never treat convergence. I read that it just gets better on its own or it doesn't. <laughs> what do you think? Um, I have actually, so I've seen the spectrum. I remember back in 2015 at the APTA's national conference and we all had rock strings out and we're all over focusing. Um, and then I've seen the other spectrum where our neurooptometrists are saying, please, please, please stop training on the Brock string solely here because we're actually contributing to the problem that when, because a type A rehab <laughs> providers, more is always better, right? And oh, they've got to be able to do it perfectly. Um, and what it has done, think about exactly what we talked about before. I'm here. I'm only training here. I'm shutting down Magno. I'm only focusing on Parvo in this convergence, like right here in my central vision that uh, we had a stint and it's better now because we're translating current evidence in better ways to use the Brock string, which I'll get to. Mm -hmm. Um, but literally had an upswing in heightened visual motion sensitivity of individuals who were going to people that were just dabbling into this visual therapy post-concussion and causing heightened symptomology. So by the time that they got back to neurooptometry, they were a disaster. So please, 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 if we don't like, please treat, like if you're going to do the Brock string and I still do it, they have to be peripherally aware at the same yes. time. So yes. that you have got parvo magno balance. So what I typically do is if we do Brock string and actually, I don't really do Brock string very much. I do more functional accommodation near far mm -hmm. charts with peripheral awareness. So, um, you know, if we're doing like that type of training where they're trying to binocular fuse, but then also be peripherally aware, I'm shining light on the wall that are different colors and they have to know, or they are right working on reading letters of saccades while juggling tennis balls out of their periphery where they can't look at the ball to catch it. Um, I have a bazillion treatment videos and different case studies that this has done really well. And I'm also super blessed to have technology. So I will put them in the Vertex CDP mm -hmm. with visual flow. So we talk about optic kinetics and checkerboards and all that other stuff to kind of like decrease that sensitivity and them to ignore moving visual environments and still remain posturally like stable. 
that is where I do feel like I have objectivity because the CDP sensory organization test, if they're not integrating vision well, it will tell me that based on age appropriated norms or if they're overly visually preferenced, I get that data too. So I actually do have some objective data that I can use and how it relates to balance that then gets me started. And we do all sorts of virtual reality cave visual flow um, and looking at, can they you know, visually react while it looks like their environment is moving towards them or they're moving through an environment. Um, and it, so if you're not following any of Dusty Groom's work out of Ohio, um, this is a, he actually just published this week that was released on post athletic concussion inside VR and looking at the unanticipated like person coming at them, like where they don't, it's more of the go, no go pathway yeah. and some of the other, but like really when it was unanticipated, our post concussive individuals reaction time is really skewed in that visual flow environment. Um, and so how do we integrate that into our rehab and make it more functional? So getting back to functional, like can a patient while they're looking at a Brock string relate this to daily life eh, versus how do we make it more neuroplastic salient? And that's where I use a lot more near far chart functional saccades at the same time, getting them on different surfaces, having them walk and do it, have them like you know, do something visually attending to a task of near far or the marched in ball while things are flying past their head and they're telling me the colors that are flying past their head, which is what the ambient or the magnocellular vision. So keeping everything in balance um, and making it as salient to the patient for what they have to be able to do. Absolutely. I think, um, you know, you named a few kind of good examples, one that I have latched onto because I feel like a lot of people, like it's a good starter for like, I call it functional convergence. I don't know if that's the right term. Uh, you know, they've got something, you know, they're already working on saccades usually. So I'm like, yay, we're doing saccades and convergence, my favorite. Um, so <laughs> they'll have like a book or something, um, you know, pamphlet in front of them. And I like letter finding because then they have to scan, um, which I find to be a nice task. So they're like finding a letter A on the pamphlet, and then I have a poster in front of them. It's just what's convenient to me in my clinic, which is, you know, the musculoskeletal system. And I know only K and W are missing, and I warn them that. And then I have them find an A on the poster. And, you know, you might just work central first just to kind of get them used to it. Then I'll have them turn, you know, and then you can start to add those, you know, just, you know, because I think building people into tasks, even if it's more just to kind of, Hmm, the cognitive aspect, the kind of getting used to like a task, I think is really key. And so it's tempting to maybe jump in and say, okay, I want to make sure I do all the things that, you know, Dr. Bliss said that are so smart about, you know, working that, but it's good to like, just kind of maybe just maybe within session, maybe it take a couple of sessions, depending on the patient, you know, and then to start to kind of add uh, a task that's appropriate. And I think it's fair to say that, you know, um, an 18 year old or 16 year old athlete, um, I'm going to probably end up progressing or moving more quickly towards that. And, and, you know, whereas my 80 year old, <laughs> just, you know, maybe, uh, complaining also of like vision issues or at baseline or whatever, you know, that I'm going to maybe make that at least simpler or slower or, you know, you, you can, it seems obvious to match it to the individual, but sometimes I think it's hard in practice for people to like sort out. Um, you know, things like that. So I just kind of mentioning that, and I don't know if you want to add anything more on that. Yeah. Nope, I think that, that's a good transition. Good. Let's talk about eye misalignment. So this comes up a lot, you know, where you maybe saw an eye go out to the side or maybe an eye is up compared to another one or down to another one, either just kind of a baseline or you're doing a simple skew or cross cover cross cover test something you learned in a course um and then people don't know what to do with that <laughs> so um right away um i'm gonna ask uh you your thoughts dr bliss um and it goes hand in hand when the eyes aren't aligned they're not conjugately working together right um, and so i like to say when i explain it to my patients and i see you know either the mild exophoria or high exophoria, which we know is more common in our post-concussive individuals, 
horror, anything like that. It's like, okay, both eyes are like trained to do this and you're following moving targets and different things. But like when one just isn't there all day long, you're here and it's like, I'm coming, I'm coming. That other eye is like late to the party is what I like to say. Um, and I usually get a chuckle, but what happens is that's where you get eye strain and headaches and cognitive fatigue. And you mentioned the cognitive system. Um, but there was just this wonderful ocular motor review of all ocular tests post concussive. Um, and I just retweeted it in the last couple of weeks, but it was so beautifully written and that the ocular motor system is so much intertwined with cognition. And we want to like parse it out and just look at motor control of the eyes, but it's so much more than that. So if you're not adding in the cognitive task, you're missing the boat in some way, shape or form. But with this ocular alignment, right? Like we want us to work on binocular tasks that our eyes are working together. And a lot of this initial intervention is going to be the near far charts, the saccades, like everything that we've already talked about. Um, and hoping that we're going to awaken the pathway that has been maladaptively trained because of symptomologies. Um, and I think this brings it into like, when do you refer, right? So I see a patient, I am so blessed because we had a whole knowledge translation action project here at Mizzou. So our referrals, I think our mean average time to get from injury to the clinic is less than two weeks right now. Um, and so I'm super blessed that they're not super maladaptive or like, you know what I mean? They come in and they don't want to move their eyes or their head or they don't want to disassociate. Um, but when they are right, like, so we're training this pretty, pretty darn early, but neurooptometrists and my best friends, the neurooptometrists on either side of me are like, Becky, you know what you're doing. Go ahead and like do some simple things or if they're going to see OT, but if they're not showing any improvements in two to four weeks, then that is when, mm -hmm. because it is that functional and not a structural injury. So I've built years of relationships with my providers that they feel pretty comfortable. And we do a lot of like, when they see them and it's like, oh, this is more vestibular. You just need to see Becky. You know what I mean? Versus, and I'm like, okay, this is more ocular. I'm gonna need some help. Maybe some stick on prisms, maybe a little bit better assessment. Um, you know, Parvo Magno with a objective assessment or our neurooptometrists actually have the um, NeuroSync, which is the ocular motor tracking device um, for more objective and normative data. So when we need more information, we go back and forth um, for that. So I usually do, okay, let's see, two weeks of how we're doing, nothing's changing, OTC and I'm nothing's changing, we definitely send the referral. Right, exactly. So yes, you may wanna refer, um, and if you're newer or more unsure, mentor and, and refer maybe more in the beginning. I mean, I think a good experienced neurooptometrist, you know, you can maybe work out observing with them. I mean, do what you can. You know, again, I realize sometimes there's not someone right next door or even two hours away, frankly. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so again, that's where that maybe that telementoring comes in and just trying to sort out and get what information you can you know, to do your best job and to, you know, remind yourself that you're not expected to treat every problem under the sun. I think sometimes we as physical therapists, we want to help so badly. It's not an ill intent. You know, we want to help, <laughs> um, but it's a balance, right? Like, like you're saying, what can I kind of just see if I just do a little bit? Oh, you know what? This is clearing up really nicely. This person's doing great um, versus somebody who, you know what? This person's had problems for 10 years, first of all. They're 10 years post-concussion. And, you know, I'm trying my kind of beginning stuff, and it's they feel like they're getting worse or they're getting more, you know, like, if and if they've already been seen, um, you could refer them to a different neurooptometrist. Not that the other one didn't good, do a good job, but the science has maybe improved since they were last seen or, you know what I'm saying? Like, so just, you know, I think always circling back. That's what I try to do. What do you think? I think the other big thing to think about is pre-existing eye conditions. So we know our younger individuals who may have had a strabismus and then maybe had some motor, like vision uh -huh. therapy as a kid. Well, after head trauma, all of those cortical mapping, beautiful therapy may revert back, right? Um, so taking a good visual history of understanding really like what were their pre-existing versus now what's current and then also like when was their last eye exam and do you know 
my older adult individual recently is like, oh yeah, I don't wear, I don't have like prescription eyeglasses. And then she reaches down. She's like, but I wear these cheaters from CVS. Okay. Let's throw those on. And now we look at some things. So, you know, you've got to just remember the big picture um, and don't get, you know, stuck in the like little idiosyncrasies of like, oh, did I see something? Did I not? I'm related. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, so, no so that intended with the seeing either, right? <laughs> I mean, I love it. All right. So saccades, we know these are eye movements from one target to another. We test those also in the VOMS. Lots of options to work on saccades. I am a fan of moving the eyes and the head. I think it's the vestibular therapist in me. I'm not against just moving the eyes at times because that's functional and normal, but you know, I love things that are, you know, kind of more functional and that most of the time you know, I'm moving my eyes and I'm moving my head to look for that car. You know what I mean? Like, so, um, you know, I don't want somebody locked in and never moving their head. Um, I mean, barring a, a neck brace or something, but like, you know what I'm saying? So there's lots of ways to work saccades. I put a nice list here. Some of my favorites, spot a game, um, you know, it's got match on any two cards. You can put it all different directions. You can work functional convergence with those cards. Um, I could get, I could just use spot it all the time. I, I do use spot it all the time. Uh, whereas Waldo, basic reading type tasks, um, anything like that. So again, saccades commonly impaired a little bit after concussion in my observation in the literature, I believe is consistent with that. Not everybody, but you know, a good percent. I find that with a little bit of work and kind of start starting at gradual again, and then adding maybe some balance type basic, even just walking forward or whatever, I see a lot of improvement in most people if you're getting them early at least, but there may be that person that needs more, you know, than you can do, in which case, again, that refer, um, referral situation could um, be appropriate. And I did put on here from another piece of literature, it's unclear if saccade abnormalities arise from ocular motor damage and or are due to cognitive problems with attention or executive control. So it just kind of circles back to what Dr. Bliss already said. The literature is saying this, you know, and it's it's very difficult, you know, chicken and egg, whatever you want to call it here. Anything you want to add on saccades? No, um, and that I think that you spoke to it, like these systems, saccades, right? Smooth Pursuit, VOR, Convergence, um, Parvo, Magno, they do not work independently. Our brain doesn't say like, oh, right now I'm going to use a cut <laughs> and then I'm going to use a VOR cancellation and then I'm going to, right? So like we are, everything is so subconscious and high fidelity and saccades can go up to 700, right? Like milliseconds. That's how, like, I mean, it is fast. And so we've got to train it for what it actually can cover um from that perspective and so the other thing we have to think about is there's 10 different psychotic eye pathways there's not just the voluntary test where we go look between my back and forth as fast as you can 10 <laughs> times that is probably the least functional of what we do all day that's long that's right and so how do we and don't forget about like automatic saccades like we see staring behavior post mild traumatic brain injury well that's because it's the anti saccade the release right <laughs> Um, so can they quickly release? Um, the other thing is visually motor guided saccades, right? Like I look at you, I turn my head and I come back and I know exactly where you are or yes. visually memory guided saccades, excuse me. Um, and so like all of that is part of daily life and how do we tie it back to function as much as possible for what they need to be able to do? Like I think of my factory worker who might be putting things up, right. And they like, and they look and then they like, we better be training, right? Visual memory guided saccades, not just like the quick back and forth between two targets. So I think that's the other big thing to think about. Absolutely. One more, one more reason to do head turns. And this is where I thought, you know, smooth pursuit. I'm like, I don't do a lot of formal smooth pursuit training. And I realize it's because, you know, functionally, I'm usually having them move their head. They might be following with, but that's more technically if you are cancellation, I suppose, if you want to slice and dice. But at the end of the day, um, you know, it's more almost if, if like, say that the swinging ball, the Marsden ball, which, um, you introduced me to, and I do have one and I love, cause it's, it's, it's very helpful, um, you know, to kind of work some different tasks, um, you know, for that dual tasking piece that you kind of alluded to. Um, but I think the idea to me is like that, let's say like following the laser, which is like, like the, the cat, the cat, <laughs> cat loves to watch the laser. Um, you know, and they might just move their eyes or, or they might move their head. Probably they would move their head. Um, but 
if it bothers you, it might be more visual motion sensitivity. So again, kind of it all circles back. And so to separate it out in these slides, I kind of laughed at the end. I'm like, you know what? Like, <laughs> it's this mix of saccades and smooth pursuit and convergence. And that's really functionally what we're doing, right? It's, it's, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I think it's like smooth pursuits operate at 20 to 30, right? Um, like, Melissa, so it's super slow, you're right, degrees per second. And so when we look at that, like, how often do we just follow a slowly moving target yeah. with our eyes? That's not, yeah. So that's why I think it's good to just train them all, like, kind of functionally together um, of what is real life experience. Good. And I don't want to spend a lot of time on light sensitivity because we don't have a lot of time, but... I know people kind of ask me about this on the regular when they're trying to do a little bit of light visual and ocular motor work. Um, so I just wanted to kind of put up a couple uh, recommendations that I had gotten a while ago um, from Dr. Gay Cronin. And I just wanted to know if you had any additions to this, Dr. Bliss. Um, no, I think the biggest thing is, um, and I don't see it as much anymore, but the whole like post-concussive let's wear glasses and like, you know what I mean? Like that avoidance um side of things i think tints are really good think about blue light um and exactly like the blue and the green there was even a recent headache specialist post-concussive that there's this green anti-migraine light that you mm. can actually buy um and change the hues and it has significantly decreased the amount of post-traumatic migraines that people have so there it's definitely out there and it's it's worth exploring but you're right we don't have time to dive deep this evening yeah and that's okay but you know we can uh, just think about a separate, I could, I could do journal clubs for the rest of my life. All right. Um, <laughs> so for any type of this visual treatment, in my opinion, virtual glorial treatment, whatever it is, uh, breaks, gradual increase, smaller chunks, pacing, these are important if you want to have success. Um, and then when we think about habituation, again, that could be a whole course, but the bottom line is if you're trying to desensitize someone to, oh dear, my pictures went over the, yeah, that's all right. Um, to visual motion, um, you want to be gradual. I like to give a task, so I'm giving them maybe um, two targets that they have to look between, or maybe a slow VOR occasionally, or something you know where they're multitasking, dual tasking while they have something maybe in their periphery or some kind of visual motion disco ball on the wall. I mean, there's there's a lot of options out there. If you have the Burtec, great. Um, you know, people love to use things like Blaze Pods. I don't know if you want to add anything to this, Dr. Bliss. No, we've got the um, BVT, the Burtech Visual Trainer right now, where it's um, augmented, not virtual. So it's 2D, not 3D. But we can actually load different videos in there to be the videos while they're doing reactive time, go, no go, um, like sequencing, mm. you name it. So we've got a little bit more of that cognitive piece, um, but it can make it realistic to what they have to go back to do, which is nice. Nice, nice. Very good. All right, and you had mentioned a couple of these, and of course I went to, so again, kind of working that periphery, some basic ideas. You can just have a paper on the wall, and there's, um, you know, lines that they have to kind of, they're looking, you know, and kind of working out into the periphery. You can ping pong ball it, and then they, again, dual tasking, find a letter while you're trying to push the ping pong ball to the periphery, you know, so there's lots of ways to work. I think the idea is just kind of trying to, get somebody outside of the center <laughs> and have them have to attend in some way to their periphery. Is that kind of a good summary there? Yeah. It's a balance between attending in central and being peripherally aware so that it's not overwhelming or um, stimulating. Exactly. Exactly. And I love my toys. I love my rings and cones and the connecting toys. You, I think you took me off to those too. Those are easy to find on Amazon, very affordably priced. Um, and then dual tasks. How do you assess it? I've got some ideas lifted up here that all came from a talk that I went to for you. So full credit to you for that. Um, you know, but dual tasking could be as simple as heel to toe gait, uh, and, you know, either counting backwards by sevens or spelling words, um, backwards, things like that. Um, and then I like to do a set distance. You look at errors, you look at the time you know, versus when they're not having to do the dual task and they're just doing the single, say, balance task or what have you. Um, and then training dual tasks. So again, this is, you know, direct from you, clipped from your 
<laughs> Twitter, I think I uh, borrowed this. So this is just showing an athlete on the BOSU to throw a little balance challenge in there, tossing the uh, connecting toy. You see the little blue kind of flying object um, mm -hmm. in the air there that I emphasize with the <laughs> uh, arrow. And then the Marsden ball. So the person is reading letters on the ball or finding letters on the ball or some sort of task like that. And then they have this toy being kind of tossed to their periphery and maybe they're supposed to catch it. Maybe they're supposed to call it the color, things like that, right? Yep. Awesome. All right. And then the technology. So we don't have a lot of time left. So I'm just going to say that there's a lot of options. There's your traditional VNG just to look at, you know, RSACADs, abnormal, things like that. Um, newer stuff, the Neurosync you mentioned. I've heard about the iBox. I've not tried it myself, but uh, read about it. Those are kind of more assessment type devices. Treatment, if you have right eye out there, DynaVision, Burtek, some versions of tasks in Virtualis to kind of have that little bit of flavor with the virtual reality type stuff out there. So um, none of this, I mean, there's research to varying levels on this stuff. Um, but I wouldn't say we're, we're to the point where we can really make really specific recommendations. What do you think? Um, I think that the, we've got some good objective, like Oculogica was FDA approved for right. like ocular motor assessment. So I think some of those are, are absolutely there. Um, for the treatment side of things, like I still use the 299 Oculus and I load up some YouTube videos and we play and I can, um, like cast green defy and say like, oh, you just walked in a grocery store. What color was the sign you just passed? And we make it cognitive, mm. um, you know, and standing on different things. So, and then there's a lot of fun. There's a sport reactive game called React, R-E-A-K-T, um, that is involved or like available via Oculus that like, it's all based on the sport of all of the different neurovisual cognitive things that you want to upweight. So, um, there's multiple options out there. I think the growing body of evidence in virtual reality, um, literally as we were on this, like <laughs> Dusty just retweeted Stop. his, uh, <laughs> most recent article specific to the unanticipated tackle in virtual reality and the visual system for the mo combined motor reactionary time training. And so please, please, please take a look at his work. Um, and I know sometimes you don't have technology, but how can you recreate that in a simulated mm. way? Mm-hmm. Excellent. All right. Well, we are going to go and try to at least answer a couple questions um, and uh, see what we can do here. So going into our question section. One second here. Are you in control? I pushed by. All right, well, I'm gonna ask one question. Oh, hang on a second. That I know got asked already. Um, what are the best activities to help with accommodative concerns with pediatric concussion patients? Yeah, so if they can't read letters yet, right? Like we do um, near far targets with shapes that they can identify animals, stickers. I mean, you can be as creative, um, but really looking at near versus far and getting that faster react in time to write like focus near focus bar and it'd be crystal clear. Um, so I do a lot of training in that way. Awesome. Um, I think we covered what are the indications for referring to vision rehab. So I'm not going to hit that one up. Um, currently some third party payers do not want to pay for visual rehab services offered by neurooptometrists. Um, is there any way you could convince the payer? So I have seen neurooptometrists actually employ occupational therapists, physical therapists, and then they bill under CPT codes um, that are, and you know, neuromuscular re-ed, therapeutic activities. Um, I have not seen convincing the like insurance companies of that. I think that there are ways around some of the rehab strategies um, to have rehab providers so that you could bill the rehab codes. <laughs> That's what I've seen. Got it. Got it. So that's, that's a way. All right. Very good. Um, another issue or question, I guess that's an, also an issue. Um, when do we start convergence exercises and if you're getting symptoms during convergence, do you continue or stop? I think that second one is still relevant. Even if you're doing more of those functional convergence questions, kind of how do we handle yeah. those symptoms? And this could really to me be with any uh, kind of ocular oh, motor yeah. balance um, training. I think 
some of it is reassurance therapy that we have to tell the brain there's something wrong in order for it to fix it. So like if we're doing this and it's all easy and you don't have symptoms, why are we doing it? Um, and so I go on the like, kind of like the same with the graded aerobic activity um, with like Letty's approach is like two to three levels above your baseline, not at the first sign. Because um, if you've heard me talk about before um, or any of the webinars of fear avoidance behaviors, we sometimes are the cause of it. So we're over-focused on them saying like, okay, what's your symptom now? What's your symptom now? How, like, you know, did that increase your symptoms? And then the minute they say they have symptoms, we have them sit down. What is it telling the brain yep. that all symptoms are bad? Um, so it's a lot of patient education in the beginning. And that, and I will say, you said this before, um, but like using their eyes in their normal fashion is exercise all day long too. So not avoiding, but grading it, pacing it, right? Like, um, and kind of coming to that behavioral contract with them a little bit, like, you know, two to three is kind of where my stop point is. Take a rest, take a break, go do something else and then come back, you know, those types of things. Yeah. Right. It's the same conversation to me that you would have with a patient about, you know, well, should I do my home exercise program every day? And I'm like, well, if you know you're going to have a loaded day, <laughs> you know, that can be your day off in my book. Like, you know what I mean? Like you got to be reasonable, whether it's a physical exercise on the knee or it's ocular motor balance for the concussion stuff. I mean, that's how I kind of view that one. But um, we do have a nice question here from Rain Physical Therapy and Wellness. Can you explain the importance of the recovery point with convergence? That is outside my scope. I'm going to say I don't know. Um, you know what I mean? And that's what I think the article spoke like beautifully about is some of this stuff is complex enough. Like I don't typically measure it in my assessment. Um, I do think my occupational therapists do. And so that's probably like, you know, it's definitely within their real house, but like that would be a specific question, I think for neurooptometry or functional vision occupational therapists. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think logically I say, I would say, you know, like it's not something I would measure regularly either, but I think if you're noticing functionally, you know, the patient's like, okay, well, I went near, and then when they go a little further, you know, they're complaining of symptoms, just kind of think about that. I mean, it doesn't mean it's something that we have to, like, be experts on, but I think, yeah, just kind of noticing and paying attention, and then again, like, is that getting better as we they kind of do some of these functional tasks we give them or not? And, you know, it, again, that two to four weeks, I think, was a nice recommendation to say, like, okay, we've been working on this, <laughs> you know, it's not getting better or you feel worse every time we do this. Like, you know, at a certain point, you know, if the person's being consistent and doing, you know, their home program and all that good stuff, then, you know, it's definitely for that time for that second look, I would say to say, because there's some barriers, there's some block um, as to why, you know, maybe you're not able to progress. And I think someone taking a look at, you know, say a neurooptometrist in this example, you know, to say, okay, yeah, there's a serious eye alignment issue here that you couldn't have possibly picked up. Um, and we're going to, you know, address it in this manner. Um, you know, and then sometimes I've had patients go see you know, vision therapy for a bit and then kind of come back to me when they're ready for the vestibular piece again. You know, if that's kind of the order we need to do. People have asked about the optimal treatment progression, and I always laugh. Um, the only thing I'll say for sure on my end is, as soon as I can get them exercising in some capacity, that's like my number one priority, um, even if it has to be laying down. Um, and then uh, after that, it's really about, of course, that old, what did you find? Where are the deficits? And then, you know, if ocular, motor, and vestibular are big, but the neck is also big, well, I'm going to need to move the eyes and head for the ocular motor. I better work on the neck. Oh, anything you want to add on that? No, um, if range is limited from a cervical spine, I always take a look at the neck first. I make sure that like they've got good range and then we add in layering as far. So like my order of treatment is post-concussive aerobic activity early and get them moving um, because it's got the best supportive, strongest body of evidence behind it. Cervical stuff um, and then some ocular. And then within the ocular, I'm actually already stimulating vestibular. So like it all works together. Perfect. Absolutely. 
Uh, all right, so on that note, of course, <laughs> I never seem to be able to not be over time, no matter how hard I try, darn it. <laughs> uh, but we're not too far, too far off, so thank you those who stuck with us this whole time. And, uh, you know, you'll always listen in chunks if you don't have the time to go over a little, so I appreciate you all for joining us tonight. Um, and I see some thank yous and some welcomes and some awesome works and some hi, Helena and Becky from um, some various folks. So we appreciate all those hellos and we say hello back and um, thank you all for joining us. And uh, we look forward to seeing you next month at our next journal club in February. We'll be doing some uh, pretty cool discussion about cervical genetic dizziness, manual therapy, what's it all about, you know, um, does cervical genetic dizziness exist? Always the age-old question. It's all coming up. So um, we thank you, uh, Becky, for joining us. You're amazing, as always, and we appreciate your insights, and uh, we look forward to uh, many future collaborations. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me. All right. Have a good night, everyone. <laughs>